Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the National Constitution Center's virtual version of America's Town Hall. I am Jeffrey Rosen, the president of the National Constitution Center, and it is so wonderful to welcome you here. Thank you so much for taking time in the middle of the day to educate yourself about the Constitution. And thanks to all of you who have been joining our phenomenal virtual programs over the past couple of weeks, including that very meaningful educational experiment where we joined C with C-SPAN in having panels asked after each of the live Supreme Court oral arguments over the past two weeks and brought together leading scholars to help us understand what's going on. We've developed an important ritual in these programs. We begin by reciting the mission of the National Constitution Center. And I've been impressed to recite the entire mission, uh, not just the edited version. So you can recite along with me in your homes and living rooms, and let's impress and inspire our panelists with the fervor of our recitation. So here we go. The National Constitution Center is the only institution in America chartered by Congress to disseminate information about the U.S. Constitution on a nonpartisan basis in order to increase awareness and understanding of the Constitution among the American people. Beautiful. I could feel it through the screens. Okay, now we're here to discuss today uh, one of the most uh, infamous cases in Supreme Court history, uh, Plessy versus Ferguson. This is the 224th anniversary of, Ple of Plessy, if I'm counting right. Uh, it was indeed um, on Monday, uh, May 18th, 1896, uh, a Monday uh, on this very day that the Supreme Court decided this case, which held that separate but equal railway, railway cars did not violate the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, nor other parts of the 13th and 14th Amendment. And that decision was overturned in Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. And we're here to understand the decision, its historical roots, and its legal reasoning from the author of an absolutely fascinating new book about Plessy and with two of America's leading scholars of the 14th Amendment. So it's a remarkable group, and I'm delighted to introduce them to you now. Steve Luxenberg is an associate editor at the Washington Post and an award-winning author, and his new book, Separate, The Story of Plessy versus Ferguson and America's Journey from Slavery to Segregation, uh, was selected as a New York Times 2019 notable book. Uh, his first book was Annie's Ghost, A Journey into Family Secrets, and he has uh, uh, long been uh, pioneering and extremely uh, gifted editor at the Washington Post, and I've had the pleasure of working with him there. Uh, Risa Galyubov is the dean of the University of Virginia School of Law. She is the 12th and first female dean, and she's also a professor of history in the Corcoran Department of History, a faculty affiliate at the Carter G. Woodson Institute for African American and African Studies. Uh, and she is author of an absolutely pathbreaking book, so relevant to our discussion today, The Lost Promise of Civil Rights, Vagrant Nation, uh, uh, Police Power, Constitutional Change, and the Making of the 1960s, and a number of other works. And it's also a tremendous honor to welcome our friend Ted Shaw. He is the Julius L. Chambers Distinguished Professor of Law and Director of the University of North Carolina Center for Civil Rights. He's published many uh, books and articles, including the introduction to the Ferguson Report, United States Department of Justice Civil Rights Division. Among his, uh, in 1982, he joined the staff of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund, where he worked for over 26 years. And among his other many extraordinary achievements, he is the author of the Interactive Constitution's Joint Explainer on the Equal Protection Clause, which I want you all to read after the show today, because it is so illuminating. Uh, friends, please join me in welcoming Steve Luxenberg, Risa Galyubov, and Ted Shaw. Now, uh, let's begin with you, uh, Ted. Congratulations on your uh, wonderful new book on Plessy, which I read with such great profit and interest. And it is striking that you begin the book not in 1896, but in Massachusetts, 1838 to 1843, describing uh, uh, the fact that Jim Crow laws gained velocity in the South at the end of the 19th century, but Jim Crow did not originate there. Separation had no role in the South before the Civil War. Slavery required close contact, coercion, and even intimacy. It was the free and conflicted North 
that gave birth to separation. Tell us about that amazing story with which you begin the book. Massachusetts, it's a late summer day in Salem in 1838. What's going on and how did that lead to the case that became Plessy versus Ferguson? Well, there was no pandemic going on that day. Uh, I think that uh, it's best to start by saying that we all know separate but equal, but we rarely know anything about the case. That included me. And I was uh, stunned to learn that separation began on the very first day of the opening of the Eastern Railroad in Massachusetts in September of 1838. Uh, there were eight passenger railroads operating in those days. This is the dawn of the railroad age. And you have to think about the dawn of the railroad age the way we think about the dawn of the personal computer or the cell phone. It was a revolution. The idea that you were now riding in a railroad car, a smelly railroad car with fumes wafting through, uh, the idea that you would be there with other people and you had to make a decision about where might you sit. So there were eight passenger railroad uh, companies, but only three required separation. So immediately, as with much of American history, you had division, a division of how, how to uh, behave. Uh, and that lasted for five years in Massachusetts. There was a lot of hoorah. The abolitionists were in full swing, the Massachusetts Anti-Slavery Society, and uh, they protested. And eventually, they pressured the Massachusetts legislature, which did not act, but which uh, created enough public steam to cause the end of the three railroads uh, decision to separate. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, there's so much uh, in the book about the path from that early decision to Plessy itself. And I thought we would uh, jump fast forward to the decision itself, just so we understand the legal reasoning of it. And then we can, of course, take, take our way back and understand how we got there. Uh, Risa, uh, tell us about Plessy versus Ferguson, decided in 1896. Uh, uh, what did Justice Brown hold for the majority about why, in his view, separate but equal was consistent with the Constitution? Yeah, so Justice Brown wrote for the majority of the court, and it was seven to one, with Justice Harlan as the only dissenter. And basically, the idea was that the state has a lot of power to regulate in the promotion of the safety, health, morals of its people. The police power is just an enormous wellspring of power that states have. And the states can regulate so long as what they do is not unreasonable. Uh, and the question that the court asked here, this is how they thought about it then. We think about this quite differently now. But at the time, uh, they asked, was this unreasonable? And the court said, no, it wasn't unreasonable. The 14th Amendment to the Constitution, one of the post uh, Civil War amendments that created new civil rights uh, stated that all people, that no state shall deny the equal protection of the laws to any person. Uh, and what uh, Justice Brown says is that was intended to create equality before the law, but it was not intended to create what they called social equality or to eliminate social distinctions or to force people to mingle socially in the ways that Steve was just talking about. You know, one of the ironies of the case is, in fact, that this law prevented people from mingling and the court, when it described the law treats it as if um, Plessy is asking for, you know, the state to require people to commingle, which wasn't at all what was happening. Um, but the court basically says the equal protection is about legal rights and legal equality before the law, not about social rights. And uh, the court is not going to uh, 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 enforce what it calls social rights. And one of the main arguments that Plessy and uh, his lawyers made was that this wasn't really about separation, uh, separate but equal, and it really wasn't about, you know, comfort, uh, uh, the way Steve was talking about a minute ago, right? It was it was about um, denigrating African Americans, and that everybody knew that this was meant to be uh, about not allowing African Americans to sit with whites. It was not about just generally uh, separating people who were of equal standing. Um, and so the court says, well, no, no, this is just this is just separation. There's no denigration. There's no stigma. There's no inferiority here. And uh, and this is important for for what we're going to talk about later. I think they say if you Homer Plessy feel that this was stigmatizing to you, 
That's your problem. That's the way you're reading the law. That wasn't, that's not how the law was intended. Um, that, that was the argument that Plessy and his lawyers made, and they very much uh, dismiss that argument. Um, uh, I can go, I can tell, talk about Harlan's dissent. Would you like that, Jeff? Well, let, um, you've done such a great job with the majority opinion, so why don't we uh, ask Ted to talk about the great. dissent, if that's okay, and, and, and pick up on, on, on the very powerful uh, points that you just made, and just to uh, repeat a few of them so, uh, it, so, so all of our friends are sure that we have them. Risa just said, uh, Justice Brown for the majority said, the question is, is it reasonable? Uh, and uh, this could plausibly be construed as equal. Uh, whites couldn't sit with blacks and blacks not with whites. And then she said the court rejected the idea that everyone knew what the real purpose of the law was, which was to stigmatize and degrade blacks. Everyone knew. And Justice Brown said, and I'm going to now quote his language, we consider the underlying fallacy of the plaintiff's argument to consist in the assumption that the enforced separation of the two race stamps the colored race with a badge of inferiority. If this be so, it is not by reason of anything found in the act, but solely because the colored race chooses to put that construction upon it. Ted, help us understand the gap between uh, that blithe assumption by the majority if people think this is stigmatizing and degrading, that's African Americans people's fault, and Justice Harlan's uh, recognition, as Risa put it, that everyone knows what the real purpose of this law was. And tell us about the reasoning behind Justice Harlan's lone dissent. Well, first, let me say what an honor it is to be with you uh, today and with my colleagues. Uh, I'm grateful for that, um, especially in this time, uh, any time, but especially in this time. Um, what you just referred to and what Risa referred to with respect to uh, uh, Justice Brown, we would call today gaslighting, which of course <laughs> picks up from uh, that, I think is a 1940s movie and um, uh, has become commonly used, particularly by young people, but that's what it was. Uh, it, made, uh, it was intended to make uh, people who were being victimized uh, feel as if they were responsible for their victimization. Um, and in that respect, uh, I remember being at a conference at Harvard Law School in 1996. That seems like a long time ago now. Uh, but that was the centennial of Plessy. And my uh, uh, dear friend and a mentor, uh, he's now been gone for a while, uh, uh, the Third Circuit uh, judge, federal court judge, A. Leon Higginbotham, said that Plessy was wrong the day it was decided. Um, and one of the reasons it was wrong was that, um, that intellectual dishonesty of saying that African Americans put that, uh, that interpretation of uh, the mark of inferiority uh, on um, the legislation at issue. Um, Harlan uh, from Kentucky, I think at the time he may have been the only non-Ivy um, uh, League or at least one of the top law school um, graduates who served on that Supreme Court. You know, he went to a, a small law school in Kentucky, I think, um, uh, don't even remember whether he got a full law school education as opposed to what people used to do to become lawyers in many places in those days. Um, but it's ironic that he was the only dissenter, and he wrote this powerful dissent. He already was known for his dissents. Uh, think back to the civil rights cases, but also to other cases. And um, he wrote this dissent that's now famous. It has one of the most well-known lines uh, that get cited in uh, uh, Supreme Court jurisprudence, but also in national discourse with respect to uh, considerations of race. He said the Constitution is colorblind, um, and it just doesn't draw distinctions between uh, citizens, and colorblindness became uh, the antidote to uh, the evil of racial discrimination, and um, that has uh, echoed down throughout the ages, even though 
the Supreme Court to this day, it may come to this point, but it has not yet said that race consciousness per se, all race consciousness um, is unconstitutional. So he wrote this dissent. Uh, he took issue with the notion that, uh, that the uh, racial discrimination in the segregation law was not intended to subordinate African Americans. And he said that, uh, look, the Constitution doesn't draw these distinctions. Now, to be, to be accurate, of course, the, um, uh, the opinion, almost in the next breath, uh, goes on to talk about uh, the white race being the superior race uh, and the fact that uh, as a matter of social uh, relationships, uh, you know, the, the, the white race would in all likelihood in education and business and everything else continue to be um, the superior race. There's one other thing I want to mention. Uh, I, although it's not mentioned in the opinion, uh, the, um, uh, and I think um, that Steve picks up on this, if I remember correctly, in his book, but I think it's really important to note that the year before Booker T. Washington gave uh, a speech in Atlanta, the Atlanta Exposition uh, speech, in which he tried to assure white people that black people were not trying to be their equals in all respects. He told black people, cast down your buckets where you are, uh, you know, um, engage in agriculture, use your hands, etc. Don't threaten white people for political power. Uh, and he told white people, you should not be threatened by black people. Um, they've been loyal to you uh, for so long, and they'll continue to be loyal to you. Treat them, uh, you know, treat them good, but uh, don't be threatened because they're not trying to be your, uh, your political equals. Um, no mention of that in the opinion, uh, but I suspect, um, I, I know Steve suspects that uh, those on the court were aware of that speech um, because it certainly was consistent with what the support, what the court did uh, in Plessy. Thank you so much for all that. Uh, Steve does indeed mention Booker T. Washington's speech in the setting of Plessy. And thank you, uh, Ted, for calling our attention to that central, famous, jarring, and inspiring passage from Harlan, which I'm going to read just because it's so central to what we're discussing. Justice Harlan says, as you mentioned, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. And so it is in prestige and achievements in education and wealth and in power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. But in view of the Constitution, in the eyes of the law, there is in this country no superior dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here, C-A-S-T-E. There is no caste here. And then the famous words, our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens in respect of civil rights. All citizens are equal before the law. In those words, as you said, Ted, are mixed this uneasy nativist claim that whites will continue to maintain social superiority with the insistence that with regard to the law, there be civil equality. Now, Steve, there's so much for you to unpack because you've done the most comprehensive historical account of the intellectual sources of Plessy that exists. I'm going to begin with the, your amazing epilogue, where you note that Justice Brown, who, as Ted said, was definitely an Ivy Leaguer, he seemed more interested in going to Yale reunions than anything else, wrote at the end of his life a notation, a kind of uh, article in tribute to Justice Harlan, the dissenting opinions of Justice Harlan, where he pays tribute to Harlan in 1912, and first describes his own majority opinion, describes Justice Harlan's dissent, and then says he assumed, speaking of Harlan, what is probably the fact that the statute had its origin and the purpose not so much to exclude white persons from railroad cars occupied by blacks as to exclude colored people from coaches occupied or assigned to white persons. What do you make, Steve, of that remarkable uh, clause, what is probably the fact? You say just five words, but if Brown and the majority had accepted them as true in 1896, 
then that would have uh, led to a narrower decision. Did, did Brown change his mind? And more broadly, the, the question you've heard both Risa and Ted ask is, why was Harlan the only one who understood what was obviously the fact, what everyone knew, and why did all the seven other justices come out the other way, and what was the intellectual and constitutional mindset of the time that led that decision to be so lopsided? Well, thanks for about six questions there, Jeff. There's a lot. I'll, I'll go after it this way. So let's start with the idea of why did Harlan understand? Significantly, not only was he not from the Ivy League, although the Ivy League was very different in the mid 19th century than it is today. Not only that, but he, uh, uh, he, was the, he served in the Civil War. Brown did not. Now, Harling was a Southerner, a slaveholder's son. He was somebody who had opposed the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. And yet he also served as a union officer. And I think what he, he knew what it was like to be of color, to be African-American living in the South. Brown had no idea. He was from Massachusetts. He moved to Detroit as a young man. That was where he became a federal judge. And I think that that gulf that existed between them was as significant as anything else. S s uh, same uh, context, the lawyer for Plessy was also a, a Civil War officer in the North. Uh, so here you have Harlan in, a Kentucky, in Kentucky, which is not the Confederate state, but it is a border state and it has slavery with this very different view of, of life. He was also a politician. Let's not forget that. He wanted to be on the Supreme Court, which was not as much of a plum job in those days as it is today. There were many people who declined because they thought it would actually hurt their careers. Uh, but he was a guy who uh, I think came into the office with a very different understanding of how things worked. Uh, you asked about the epilogue about Brown's uh, article in the, uh, in, the, in the Law Review Journal in 1912. It's very difficult to say that he changed his mind. I think it's significant that he did not claim majority ownership of that decision. He wrote about it as if it was perhaps some other justice who had said these, uh, these things in 1896. Uh, he didn't disclaim it, but I think that he could have paid tribute to a couple of other justices who had died between 1896 and 1912. He chose Harlan and only Harlan, and I think we could put some weight on the idea that he regarded Harlan's dissents in civil rights cases as noteworthy, if for no other reason than it was because it was what defined Harlan, and he wanted to make note of that. Uh, I don't think it would have changed history had uh, they paid attention to Harlan's dissent, I still think that the court, you, as you said, Jeff, it could have made a much narrower ruling, but it wouldn't, I think, have stopped separation and segregation from happening. I say in the book that the Supreme Court, and especially in that era, were followers and not leaders. They knew what public opinion was all about. It was white public opinion they were concerned about. And I think they would have made a similar decision in some other case when it came along. The other thing to remember about the Supreme Court in the 1890s is, when I hear the Supreme Court on the radio today or online with an uh, important decision coming along, I immediately think division, 5-4, what's the swing vote? How's it going to go? In the 1890s, 90% 90 of the Supreme Court's decisions were unanimous. Five, four decisions were not only rare, in some of the court terms, there were zero. There were no five, four decisions. They really believed in unanimity because it gave them credibility. We all know that the Supreme Court has no police force to send out. Uh, the idea of the federal troops going to Arkansas in the 1950s after the Brown case that was a rare moment in the 50s as well as in the 1890s. So it's a very different court, and I think we have to remember that. They were all of the same class. They were all white. They were all wealthy. They all believed in property rights. This was not a court that was easy to persuade to be at 5-4, let alone to be unanimous as the court was in the Brown decision in 1954. 
Thank you for all that. Uh, you, you answered uh, the question of Henry Stoller, who asks, uh, what were the factors in Justice Harlan's childhood upbringing and education and experience which might have contributed to his being disposed to dissent? And your point about unanimity was very powerful in the book, uh, although you do note that uh, Albion Tourguet, uh, Homer Plessy's lawyer, was watching the composition of the court closely, and when uh, Republican justices resigned and were replaced by President Harrison with uh, Democrats, and then with Grover Cleveland with more Democrats, the vote counting, uh, Tourguet uh, feared uh, that he wouldn't be able to count to five. Re Risa, can you cast light on this question of why the decision was seven to one, why only Harlan recognized what everyone knew then and certainly knows now the real purpose of the law was, why the court didn't even consider Homer Plessy's other arguments, including the fact that the law deprived him of his property interest in possibly being viewed as a white person uh, in classifying him without a hearing, and also denied his rights of personal liberty under the Due Process Clause and restricting his freedom of travel. And, and broadly, I guess the, the question is, and this is coming up in the chat box, was Plessy clearly wrong the day it was decided in 1896, or did it only be, come to be seen as wrong later? So uh, just like with Steve, that was a lot of different questions, Jeff. Uh, and you know, the the last one is is an age old question about how do you understand people in their own historical time, and and what kind of judgments do we make of those people from our historical time? Uh, I think there's a good argument to be made that Plessy was wrong the day it was decided. Um, that's not to uh, undermine that we should do the hard work of understanding why it was those justices did what they did. But I would say it was wrong the day it was decided. Um, so there are a lot of different ways you can answer the question of why, and I think there are a lot of different causes. But um, I want to start with one thing that Steve said about you know the nature of the court and uh, and and the the court kind of following rather than than promoting public opinion. I do think um, Plessy comes after, you know, 20 years of the court eviscerating the Reconstruction Amendments. So, you know, after the Civil War, these the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments are ratified, ending slavery, providing equal protection of the laws, among other things, in the 14th Amendment, and then uh, providing voting rights, uh, uh, ensuring voting rights to, regardless of color. Um, in the 15th Amendment. And during the post-Reconstruction era, the Supreme Court really undermines all of those, uh, uh, all of those amendments. And they do so uh, in moments, not in this case, but in earlier cases, in the civil rights cases of 1883, uh, and in other cases, they do so when the legislature is actually promoting the civil rights of African Americans. And then the court forbids Congress from, the, from creating those protections and really narrowly reads uh, these amendments. So one, one thing to say is this is par for the course of the court in, uh, in the late 19th century. And, um, and we often see, and I know we're coming to this later, but we often see the court as kind of the counter-majoritarian hero in Brown uh, that, uh, that steps up and, and supports African Americans. And one of the reasons why African Americans through the NAACP, where Ted used to work, um, you know, were bringing cases to the court was they didn't have voting rights, they didn't have political power, they they were unable to make their case in other forums, and in fact, it was the court who had made it impossible for them to make their case in other forums uh, in the late 19th century. So that's one piece of it, um, a kind of legal institutional piece. A second piece, I think, is really about culture and politics and society. So as Steve's book shows so well, you know, racism, racial exclusion, segregation, none of this was ever limited to the South. Uh, there, there was segregation in the North, incredible uh, racial subordination and exclusion in the North as well. And uh, after the Civil War uh, and after the Reconstruction era, the the Northern and Southern whites are looking for reconciliation. They want to come together. Uh, part of Booker T. Washington's speech is about the coming together. Um, they're, they're, they're looking for ways to, uh, to join rather than separate. And by the 1890s, that's certainly the case. Um, it's also the case by the 1890s that the racial tensions in the North are growing. Uh, so there's more and more African-American 
American migration to the North. There are more and more immigrants who are seen as unwhite. There are people we would think of today as white people from Southern and Eastern Europe um, who are coming into the North as immigrants. Um, and so the, the idea that Northerners are going to be more progressive on race and Southerners less so, I think is just not true at the time. I mean, the nation was born in slavery, it was born in racial subordination, and, and it continues all the way through this period. So I think um, I, I think I, I would say this was wrong at the time. And you can see Harlan articulating some of what was wrong. But even as you all have been saying, um, even as he did so, he couldn't get out of his time either. He still thought the white race would always be superior. And he, in fact, has something in his opinion about um, even though this would be the case for African-Americans, he couldn't even fathom this for the Chinese. And he, in fact, dissents in some cases where uh, 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 U.S. born uh, Chinese immigrants, uh, the court says, are citizens, and he says they're not. So um, you see Harlan is a man of his times as well. So I think we look back and we say, of course, this was wrong. Um, but the, and I haven't even gotten to all the, I'll stop talking because I've talked for a while, but there are legal arguments, there are social arguments, there are cultural and demographic arguments. There are so many reasons why the, as well as the kind of biographical ones that Steve was talking about, who these men were and what kind of a view of the world they had. Um, I think it was too radical for them to imagine um, the kind of equality that we think they should have been imagining uh, and that we hope to see in our time. Thank you for all that and for stressing the fact that uh, North and South uh, white people were trying to come together uh, at that time, uh, a point which emerges so uh, powerfully in Steve's book in the figure of Justice Brown, who's seeking uh, for moderation above all, and also for noting that really jarring language in Harlan's dissent about uh, about uh, Chinese uh, immigrants, immigrants from, uh, from uh, China. He says there's a race so different from our own that we do not permit those belonging to it to become citizens of the United States. Uh, I allude to the Chinese race, but by the statute in question, a Chinaman can raise, ride in the same passenger coach with white citizens, while citizens of the black race, many of whom perhaps risk their lives for the preservation of the Union, are not excluded by law. And there we're seeing the nativism that Steve describes in Harlan, who was a member of the Know Nothing Party before he became a Republican, um, coexisting uneasily next to that insistence on equal civil rights for African American. Ted, we, we have lots of questions wanting more uh, insight into whether Plessy was clearly wrong at the time it was decided or became wrong later. And we have a question from uh, 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 from John uh, from Kenneth Feldman. In 1896, the Supreme Court was uh, six Republicans and three Democrats. Why was the vote lopsided? You'd think that Republicans would be more friendly to Plessy. Uh, Preeta Narayanan asks, was the opinion of Ivy Leaguers very narrow back in the 1890s? Was it due to the limited exposure of Northerners to Southerners? Um, cast your wisdom, Ted, please, on why you think the decision was eight to one and whether or not it was wrong in 1896 or became wrong later. Well, um, those, of course, are, are good questions. Um, uh, we haven't talked about the fact that uh, Plessy was a, a test case. Maybe we'll get to that. Steve certainly, in his, in his excellent book, um, spends time talking about how the case came to be. Uh, but I want to underscore something. When we say that... Uh, people or these men were the product of their times, yes, that's true. Um, but it begs the question um, of whether they get off the hook because of that or they should, because there were other people in those times, even though they were in the minority, um, who did understand uh, that um, slavery, for example, was an evil. Uh, Thomas Jefferson uh, you know, acknowledged that. Uh, he said that, I fear for my country, I tremble for my country when I think that God is just. Um, and, uh, of course, there were, uh, you know, there was Charles Sumner, uh, Thaddeus Stevens. Um, you know, you had John Bingham, one of the principal authors of the 14th Amendment, um, and they understood, uh, you know, the fact that 
uh, slavery and then segregation um, was wrong. All of these, uh, uh, God bless them, all of these uh, old white ladies, they weren't all old, but uh, from New England who in the early part of the 19th century would go down to Washington, D.C. and advocate uh, before Congress, or they'd attempt to do it, uh, to, uh, or in the cause of abolition. Uh, and there was, of course, uh, you know, the Senate and, and the House, they, they banned um, any debate about slavery. So the point is, is that a lot of people knew that slavery was wrong. Um, so in my view, they don't get off the hook. I think we have to look at the Plessy case um, as, yes, a product of its time, um, uh, and we also have to look at it as uh, a key point in the continuum um, uh, of slavery and Jim Crow segregation, which even to this day, when we uh, put that continuum together, uh, accounts for uh, the vast majority of the years of the existence of this country and uh, certainly even uh, a longer period of time since the arrival of the colonists here in the United States. Plessy was the stuff of racism. Uh, and so if, uh, if Plessy uh, was not wrong, uh, then racism wasn't wrong. Uh, I don't accept that, uh, and many other people uh, don't. Um, although certainly the country has moved forward over the decades and uh, the centuries um, toward a better place. Uh, so uh, I wanted to also point out um, uh, quickly uh, that um, the people who were on the court, those eight justices who voted uh, for the majority opinion, it wasn't their, uh, the fact that they were um, Ivy Leaguers, um, although they, they were, or most of them were. Um, the Ivy Leaguers of that day, like uh, uh, many Americans, Northerners and Southerners, did believe in the stuff of racial superiority and inferiority. Uh, so I just wanted to underscore that, although, as I said, Judge Higginbotham used to talk about um, that fact and where Harlan came from uh, to make a point that underscored that, uh, you know, you didn't have to be um, uh, an Ivy Leaguer to get it right. One other thing about Harlan that uh, we should note and that Steve um, has picked up on in, in his book. Uh, like many um, Southerners, white Southerners, uh, you know, Harlan um, is reputed to have had a black brother. Uh, there's a whole lot that we could say about that. He was a fascinating individual. Um, the point is, is that out of slavery comes a set of complex relationships that reverberate to this day about who and what Americans are um, and their relationship with one another. Harlan may have also had some sensitivity and understanding um, because that's the context that he comes from also. Um, so we could talk more about that. Uh, but Steve is right. Brown and the other justices... Um, as far as we know, um, didn't have that Southern experience. Thank you so much for that. What a powerful statement. If uh, Plessy isn't wrong, then racism isn't wrong. And also to note that this was not uh, limited to Ivy Leaguers by any means. This was very much the social uh, consensus of the time among white people. Steve, so many questions for you about 
the characters in this case, there, there are more questions about Justice Harlan. Mary Jo Kirschman asked, didn't Harlan's wife and home life influences change in ideas about slavery? What was the role of women in the abolitionist and anti-slavery movements? And then we have uh, a great eighth grade class from, uh, from Leon Mott. And Ms. Mott's students want to know how, me how any employee of the railroad knew Plessy was of African-American Descent, and you tell so rivetingly the story of how Plessy was a test case, how he talked to Albion Turgay, and this question of who decided who was African American is so relevant. So a beat on Harlan, and then just tell us about how the case arose, who who Plessy was, and and, and what exactly Albion Turgay was trying to achieve. Well, I want to pick up on both Risa and Ted's uh, point about um, other people in the 19th century not believing that this decision was right. The, the, the story of Separate, the, my book, is this really a story of a, of a two-sided narrative, a double narrative. You can't have a legal case without people bringing the case. The justices are at the end of the decision. They're not at the beginning. And so throughout the 19th century, you have resistors to slavery you have resistors to uh, separation. And I tell that story, and most of those resistors, nearly all of them, are African American. They are not operating alone. Uh, one of the things that you learn when you, when you uh, look at American history is people rarely operate alone. There's support, either in the abolition community before the Civil War or afterwards, as people uh, band together this gets into the test case, that's why I'm going there. This gets into the test case for the law students. So how did you know that Plessy was not white or not black? Well, Plessy was really neither. He was a man of mixed race color from New Orleans. And New Orleans, I would argue, is a central character in the story of the Plessy case. This case, I believe, could not have come out of any other city in the country in the way it did in the late 19th century. It came out of New Orleans because the mixed race community there, for the most part, was never enslaved. Their parents weren't enslaved. Their grandparents weren't enslaved. In Plessy's case, you have to go back to his great grandmother on one side, who was freed in, hold on for this, 1779. 1779. So he grew up in freedom. And by the time the Civil War had ended, the mixed race community of New Orleans was, had some wealth, had education, had some clout. It did not have all of its rights because it was of mixed race, but it had been agitating for those rights since the takeover of Louisiana in 1803. So by 1896, they were not a happy crowd. They didn't like this, bi, this uh, biracial America that you either are white or black that was coming around. And if you were of color, it meant you were black. And as Turgé argued for the Plessy side, who would want to be black in America if you had a choice? Wouldn't you rather be white? All the advantages are to people whom are white. So you have a test case. What does that mean? Well, they wanted to construct the case as best as they could, the Plessy team, to be favorable to their assault on the Louisiana law, the Re Louisiana separate car law. So they wanted to create the right conditions. They did not want Plessy to be arrested for uh, you know, disturbing the peace. They needed him arrested under the act that they were challenging. And so they did what all good test case participants do. They hire a private detective to make sure that the complaint gets written just as they need it to be to bring it under the act. Uh, and this is, this is a, it's not a revolutionary idea, but it's a very unusual idea. And so they also when they went to the railroad and they said, look, you have an economic stake in this. You don't want to run a separate car if you don't have to. How about joining with us? And the railroad became a silent, very important silent partner, not public, and said, sure, we'll let you do this and we will get our conductor to make sure that it happens. There's a lot of stories that get written about how Plessy got forcibly ejected and manhandled as he was thrown off of the train. I don't believe that happened. There's no evidence in the record that it happened. I believe that he was escorted politely because everybody was in on it 
and they made sure that they were going to bail him out that night because you don't want your volunteer to spend a lot of time in jail. It doesn't make for good volunteer relations. Uh, so, so the story is about resistors. I want to I want to just make the point that somebody referenced the uh, uh, Risa re referenced the uh, 20 years of previous decisions to Plessy. In 1921, Carter Woodson, an African American scholar of note who had founded the Journal of Negro History, the first of its kind, wrote an article about 50 years of Supreme Court decisions from the end of the Civil War until his article. And he pointed out that the most important case was the 1883 civil rights case, not Plessy. He gave two pages to Plessy, he gets it right, he's accurate, but in 1921, he was still looking at the civil rights case of 1883 as being the primary decision to look at. Now that changes because the Supreme Court keeps using Plessy as a precedent and by the uh, 1930s and 40s, Thurgood Marshall and the NAACP Legal Defense Fund have figured out that Plessy is the law they need, the uh, decision, not the law, but Plessy is the decision they need to attack. And that's what they do. Th thank you very much for all that. And those important insights about the civil rights cases uh, set up the subject that I want to ask Risa about. Risa, your uh, pathbreaking book uh, uh, about uh, the lost promise of civil rights emphasizes that there was a time in the 1940s when African-American agricultural workers in the American South were calling for a new civil rights law to redress economic as well as legal inequalities. And there were lawyers uh, in the federal government and elsewhere who took the workers' cases and wanted to argue that there was a fundamental right to work, uh, to economic equality, that would have uh, attacked uh, discrimination. You talk about the decision by the Brown Court and by Thurgood Marshall to focus on formal barriers to legal equality, focusing on Plessy rather than on the promise of equal public accommodations and economic rights included in the Civil Rights Act, uh, marked a shift uh, where the, that emphasis on economic equality uh, fell by the wayside. Uh, tell us more about your very, very important thesis, which has changed the way we look at Brown and uh, how it related to the path from Plessy to Brown. Sure. Thank you for that very kind description of my book, Jeff. Uh, that was very nice of you to say. Um, I do just want to say, I don't think that Ted was implying that I was letting anybody off the hook, but I, I wasn't letting them off the hook. I was no, trying no, to answer, answer the why question. So, um, but in, in terms of, you know, what happens um, post Plessy, I think, you know, um, when we, from Brown forward, when we think about what the end of Jim Crow meant and what Jim Crow itself was, I think Brown captures our imagination in a way to suggest that the kind of formal segregation um, that was the issue in the Plessy case uh, and that was, again, uh, shaped as the issue in, in the Brown case, um, and I'll come back to that in a minute, um, was the crux of, of Jim Crow. And it was certainly a huge part of Jim Crow. But Jim Crow, like slavery before it, was a system of racial subordination, racial exclusion, political and civil death, in the words of sociologist Orlando Patterson, um, uh, economic exploitation. I mean, slavery was a system of labor. It was intended to extract labor at, at, at as little cost as possible from a racially identified group of people. So it was both about race and it was about economics and Jim Crow was the same. So during Jim Crow, it wasn't only that people were separated by race, it was also that African Americans were taught in worse schools. They were only allowed to have worse jobs. And some of this was made by law and it was formally legally entrenched in our statutes and much of it was privately decided, right? So employers would only hire African Americans for jobs that were called at the time, the three H's, hot, heavy, and hard. Um, and when you look at, uh, you know, where there were, say, legal protections for workers starting in the 1930s, it excluded those areas in which African Americans were, uh, were more heavily represented, like agriculture uh, and domestic labor for especially African American women. Um, so this system was always one that was intended to racially exclude, racially separate, racially denigrate and subordinate, as well as 
economically oppress. And what you see when you start, rather than starting, as, as Steve said a minute ago, the court is the last uh, the last piece in the in the in the legal change puzzle, and then obviously creates new uh, new dynamics. But um, before a case gets to the court, it has to start with a person who says, "I've been harmed," and go to a lawyer and say, "Will you help me?" And the lawyer says, "I see a legal claim here." Um, and the kinds of claims that you see in the 1930s and 40s are claims that combine the racial harms and the economic harms. Um, and I think that one of the one of the things that Plessy does for the NAACP, there are a lot of reasons why along the road to Brown, uh, uh, the case becomes focused on education and not employment. There are a lot of reasons why it becomes focused on uh, the legal rule and not the larger uh, social and economic circumstances and economic equality more generally. But I think Plessy is really one of them, as Steve said a minute ago. The Plessy decision is out there, this decision that says, eh, segregation there's no harm to segregation if you think there's a harm it's your problem it's not because segregation inherently stigmatizes um and i think the naacp felt that in order to overturn jim crow in order to to upend this uh, this system um, that, as we've all said, was not only true in the South, but was true across the country. Um, you really had to undermine that uh, that key piece and say, no, segregation itself, given the social realities and the economic realities of our country, is inherently stigmatizing. I, I do think that as the NAACP, for really good reasons, um, narrowed in on that claim, and then the success of Brown kind of crowds out that, hey, there's this whole other half of uh, of Jim Crow that we need to work on and that we need to do. And I, I think, and maybe Ted can speak to this more, I think that Thurgood Marshall thought once you got Plessy undermined and once you got the crux of the legal claim uh, uh, overturned, the, the other pieces would come. Um, and I think we would all agree they haven't come as, as we thought they would come. And, and there are lots of uh, of questions why, but I would say um, that one of the reasons why are, are, is inherent in the, the, the dissent in Plessy, Harlan's dissent, um, going back to our earlier conversation. So colorblindness and no caste uh, sounds really good compared to the alternative in Plessy, um, but it's not actually right, I think, as, as we would see right today. And if you have colorblindness, if you have a government that says we don't see color and we refuse to think about color um, and our constitution doesn't allow us to see color, when in fact we live in a world that's shot through with racial inequality as a as a matter of our, our real reality, then the government is essentially putting its head in the sand and saying, we won't do anything to change that, or the Constitution doesn't allow us to do anything to change that. And I think Harlan's dissent in Plessy has become, um, has come to stand for that position in ways that I think have really hindered us as a nation uh, from achieving the kind of racial equality that I think we'd like to see. Thanks so much for that. And in our final few minutes, uh, Ted, I'll ask you if you, you did work for the NAACP with such distinction for 26 years. Tell us about what Thurgood Marshall was thinking after he was mentored by uh, Charles Hamilton Houston and mounted the assault on Plessy and litigated a series of cases that culminated in Brown. He read Harlan's dissent aloud to inspire himself before he argued Brown. But as Risa says, Harlan's language about how our Constitution is colorblind has now been resurrected today by constitutional conservatives like Justice Clarence Thomas, who are using it to oppose affirmative action or any race consciousness. So, so what was Harlan thinking about how to overturn Plessy? What was he trying to achieve in Brown? And what would he think about the way that Harlan's dissent is being invoked today? Well, uh, first, let me uh, put a pin in something that we don't have time to discuss, but I don't want to ignore it. Um, Steve talks about in his book um, the committee in New Orleans that brought the test case. Uh, most of these were light-skinned African Americans, privileged uh, individuals. The pin I want to put in is, uh, is about the way that um, racism has manifested also in colorism internalized within African American communities in ways that have been devastatingly harmful and that have not completely disappeared today. 
we don't have time to discuss that, but I can't ignore it. Uh, let me also then come to the point, I don't know that Harlan was planting a seed, maybe he was, but who knows what was in his mind when he wrote that line about the Constitution being colorblind, but it certainly quickly, with the establishment of the NAACP in 1909, um, became a seed, uh, because as I said before, if the notion was that racism was the evil, then colorblindness uh, became the antidote, uh, even though it's been uh, misused. Uh, Risa is exactly right about how it's used today. Um, by the way, I'm compelled to say that um, I worked for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund for almost 30 years. The Legal Defense Fund was created by and grew out of the NAACP, but it was forced to become an entirely separate organization. Both organizations um, were responsible for Brown, but the uh, NAACP is the largely the membership organization with uh, some legal arm. Uh, the Legal Defense Fund has litigated most of the uh, the cases uh, involving racial discrimination, but. Uh, the point is exactly right. These days, colorblindness is being used uh, against all efforts, to blunt all efforts, to consciously try to uh, do something about racial inequality. That's a great irony. Um, Brown was a wonderful victory at the moment it was decided, although uh, it never uh, came to be all that it could have been. Um, as we uh, uh, talk today, virtually, um, yesterday I was um, uh, communicating with a woman who is the last uh, survivor, I think, um, of the staff of the Legal Defense Fund and the NAACP, and she sent me a message about her memory of what happened on the afternoon that Brown was announced, and they were at in Thurgood Marshall's office, and she wrote me, and she said that, uh, it's a wonderful woman, uh, June Shagaloff, and she wrote me and said that um, uh, there was no shouting, there was no we won, we won, uh, there was none of the drinking and partying that uh, perhaps could have happened. Um, they were uh, somber, somewhat sober. Uh, I think from what I understood about Thurgood Marshall and his reaction, he knew uh, that there was a great task ahead. Um, I don't think that he may have known um, how difficult it would be, uh, but he suffered no illusion that everything was going to change overnight. And the staff who was with him that afternoon understood that also, as June made clear to me yesterday. Uh, so uh, it inspired, Brown inspired generations, I'm one of them, uh, and probably others here are, uh, of individuals to become lawyers, uh, civil rights lawyers, um, or to do public interest work. But Brown was no panacea. Uh, and um, Brown is often uh, honored, uh, I often say, these days, um, more in principle than in practice. It is uh, hallowed but hollow in many respects, because the Supreme Court has turned its back on uh, school desegregation in particular. Thank you so much for those very inspiring and sobering reflections. There's so much more to say, but Constitution Center town halls like Supreme Court arguments must end on time. So friends, I have to thank you again so much for joining us for this uh, really illuminating and meaningful conversation. Your homework, both members of Ms. Mott's class and, and everyone else, all the, it, I have to tell you how inspiring it is to me that nearly 300 people will convene in the middle of the day to learn and grow and uh, delve into our constitutional history. So the homework is to read Steve Luxenberg's uh, award-winning and uh, path-breaking new book, Separate, The Story of Plessy v. Ferguson and America's Journey from Slavery to Segregation. Also, Risa Golubov's path-breaking book, The Lost Promise of Civil Rights. And there's so much to read from uh, Ted Shaw, but I want you to begin with the interactive constitution's explainers on the meaning of the Equal Protection Clause. And uh, until the next uh, town hall, uh, please join me in thanking Steve Luxenberg, Risa Golubov, and Ted Shaw.
Thanks to all. Stay safe. Thanks for having us. Bye.